Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we're all about Commander on a budget. Today's episode is going to be a $50 deck tech. When I say $50, I mean that is an overall deck cost. Both shipping and commanders that are $10 or less are going to be included in that cost, but basic lands will not be. Decks on this channel are built to be fun, inexpensive, and focused. If you want to learn more about what a focused commander deck is, check out this video here. On this deck tech, I'm going to take you through its strategy, the tactics, and how this deck wins. This show and episodes like this one are possible because of viewers like you. So if you're looking for some easy ways to help support the show, make sure you like this episode and share it with friends. And make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Thank you to everyone who's already purchased our merchandise, it really does help support the channel. Another easy way to support this channel is by using our TCG Player Affiliate links. So make sure that you're looking for those links in the description whenever you're buying a deck or just individual cards. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron and I truly couldn't do this without all of their support. In today's episode, it's actually a patron-selected deck tech. Once a month, patrons vote on what commander they'd like to see in an upcoming deck tech. Whatever commander gets the most votes, wins. And the commander that they chose was Marisi Breaker the Coil. Marisi is a 5-4 cat warrior that costs 1 red, green, white. He has your opponents can't cast spells during combat, and whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, go to each creature that player controls. That means until your next turn, those creatures attack each combat a fable and attack a player other than you a fable. So it's actually a very unique commander. First off, he prevents your opponents from interfering with your combat phase. And secondly, he lets you utilize your opponent's creatures against each other. As long as you can hit each of your opponents with one creature each combat, they're gonna have to swing at each other. Goading is a very powerful mechanic because it not only protects you, but it also hurts your opponents. So what's our strategy for this deck? We're going to get some cheap, evasive creatures out so we can goad everything. There are plenty of cheap, evasive creatures out there, and this deck is going to fully utilize them. Once we're set up with one that can get through for each opponent, we're going to be in good shape. And then how do we win with this deck? We're going to pump our creatures to smash the last opponent standing. When goading our opponent's creatures, they're going to essentially be forced to kill each other. Once we're down to one opponent, they're going to be weakened, and we can easily finish them off with our pumped army. As with all Commander's Quarters decks, I'm going to take you through 10 different tactics that show you how the deck works and how we're going to win with it. So let's start off with tactic number one, start small. First up, there's Wayfarer's Bobble, which we can pay two to tap and sacrifice to get a base land into play tapped. Next up, we've got three ramp spells on turn two with Farseek, Rampant Growth, and Edge of Autumn. Farseek will get us a Mount or Plains into play tapped. And then Rampant Growth and Edge of Autumn can get any of our base lands into play tapped. This deck is extremely low to the ground though, so ramping isn't that crucial to this deck. But because we're in a three color deck, fixing our mana is, so we're going to be running Renegade Map, Traveler's Amulet, and Wanderer's Twig. Each can be sacrificed to get a base land into our hand. Again, this won't ramp us, but it will help us quickly fix our colors. We're also running some small creature ramp though, since they can help us with goading too. So now let's move on to tactic number two, Deadly Dorks. First up, we've got three elves that tap for a green with Llanowar Elves, Elvish Mystic, and Finehorn Elves. These can really help us get off to a quick start, giving us access to three mana on turn two. An even better version of these comes with Avacyn's Pilgrim since it taps for a white. Ramping and helping us fix our mana on turn one is huge. Finally, we're going to be running Sakura Tribe Elder, which we can sacrifice to get a base land into play tapped. Again, sometimes we just need bodies on the field to ensure that we can get at least one through. And of course, we've got plenty of evasive creatures that generally can do the job for us. So let's go over them now in tactic number three, Spilled Milk. First up, we've got six white one drops that do the exact same thing. Avon Skirmisher, Duskborn Sky Marcher, Kite Tail Scout, Lantern Kami, Rustwing Falcon, and Suntail Hawk are each one ones that cost a white and have flying. Now a one one is generally gonna be pretty weak in commander, but in this deck, these cheap evasive creatures are invaluable. Even if our opponents have more powerful creatures, even if we just have one creature get through, they're gonna be in big trouble. And because we're gonna be attacking with so many creatures, we're also gonna be running Loyal Pegasus. It's a two one with flying that costs a white and it can't attack or block alone. Again, our plan's gonna be that it won't be attacking alone anyways. We're also running some slightly better flyers with Healer's Hawk and Segovian Angel. Healer's Hawk has Flying and Lifelink and Segovian Angel has Flying and Vigilance. While these might not do much early, they can be powerhouses later in the game. And then we've got some 1-1 flyers with some extra effects with Toppelgeist and Fairy Guide Mother. When Toppelgeist enters the battlefield, we tap target creature and opponent controls. And then at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, if there are four more card types in our graveyard, we tap target creature that player controls. And then Fairy Guide Mother has an adventure that costs one in a white and it says target creature gets plus two plus one and gains flying until end of turn. So she can even help our commander get through if we need to. Now flying isn't always a guarantee to get through, but it does help against most opponents. One creature that's essentially guaranteed to get through though is Soltari Foot Soldier. It has shadow so it can only block or be blocked by creatures with shadow. Not too many people are running those kinds of creatures so this is nearly guaranteed to always get through. But we do have some evasive creatures though outside of white. So let's see what those creatures are in tactic number 4, Seeing Green. First up, there's Scrib Sprites, which is a 1 1 flyer in green. And then Spire Tracer essentially has flying since it can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach. And then Treetop Scout is slightly better since creatures with reach can't actually block it. Next up, we've got three green creatures with Forest Walk with Willow Dryad, Shinodin Dryad, and Jukai Messenger. Now, Forest Walk is also not a guarantee to get through. That being said, there are plenty of decks out there that run green since it's a very powerful color in Commander. 
Another powerful color in Commander is black, so we're also going to be running Marsh Boa. It's a 1-1 for a green that has Swamp Walk. Next up, we've got three creatures with Death Touch with Sedge Scorpion, Narnum Renegade, and Narwood Dryad. Now, Death Touch isn't technically a form of evasion, but it makes blocking very difficult for opponents. And these can also be fantastic blockers on their own if we need them to be. Finally, there's Wasteland Viper, which has Death Touch and can also Blood Rush for a green. By paying that green, we can discard it and target attacking creature gets plus one, plus two, and gains death touch until end of turn. So this is a combat trick that we can use if we need to. So we've gone through white and green, but we're not quite done with our evasive creatures just yet, though. So it's time for us to move on to tactic number five, color more. First up, there's Hope of Gear 4, which is a 1-1 flyer that costs 1. We can also sacrifice it until our next turn. Target player who is dealt combat damage by Hope of Gear 4 this turn can't cast on creature spells. So this is a cheap flyer that we can get out with any color, and it has some utility too. And next up, there's Ginger Brute, which is a 1-1 with haste, and we can pay 1 to make sure that it can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste. Again, having a variety of evasive abilities comes in handy depending on the opponent that we're attacking. And as long as we can get 1 through, we're going to be in good shape. But we've got some other ways to make sure that our creatures get through. Let's go through them now in tactic number six, coming through. First up, there's Girl War Chant, which gives our attacking creatures plus one plus zero in Menace. So this helps us get some extra damage in and gives us another layer of evasion. In my opinion, Menace is a very underrated ability and this deck can really utilize it. Another card that we can utilize in a variety of ways is War Cadence. It has pay X and a red. This turn, creatures can't block unless their controller pays X for each blocking creature they control. So first off, we can use this for our own creatures if we need to. As I mentioned before, we've got a very low mana curve in this stack, and that means that we're going to have a good amount of mana open and can utilize it for things like this. And we can also use this to help our opponent's creatures get through on each other too. But perhaps a more effective version of this comes with Bedlam. It simply says, creatures can't block. So our creatures are going to get through, and our opponent's creatures will get through on each other too. This can really speed up the game in the right situation, but we do have to be careful when we use it. We need to be sure that we can finish off that last opponent before they can finish us off. But aside from getting our creatures down and attacking, we need to make sure that we can keep our engine going. So now it's time for tactic number seven, quick draw. First up, there's Abundance, which doesn't technically provide us any card advantage, but it does come in really helpful. It says if you would draw a card, you may instead choose land or non-land and reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card of the chosen kind. Put that card into your hand and put all other cards revealed this way on the bottom of your library in any order. Most of the time with this out, we're just going to be choosing non-land. So this can essentially prevent us from having any dead draws with lands. Next, if we're running Harmonize, which is a very simple but effective draw spell, it's going to draw us three cards. And then we've got Hunter's Insight and Return of the Wild Speaker, which can help utilize our commander's power to draw some cards. Hunter's Insight says, choose target creature you control whenever that creature deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker this turn, draw that many cards. And then Return of the Wild Speaker says, choose one, draw cards equal to the greatest power among non-human creatures you control or non-human creatures you control get plus three plus three until end of turn. So both of these can essentially draw us five cards in different ways and Return of the Wild Speaker can even be a finisher if we need it to be. And then we've got some ways to draw cards through combat with Overwhelming Instinct and Keeper of Fables. Overwhelming Instinct says, whenever you attack with three or more creatures, draw a card. Again, attacking with three creatures each combat is what this deck is built around, so we're almost always going to hit that mark. Keeper of Fables can draw us even more cards because it says whenever one or more non-human creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, draw a card. The majority of creatures in this deck are non-human, so this can draw us up to three cards each turn. Next up, we've got some ways to draw a ton of cards at once with Collective Unconscious, Shamanic Revelation, and Camaraderie. Each of them will draw us a card for each creature that we control. On top of that, Shamanic Revelation can gain us four life for each creature we control with power four or greater. And then Camaraderie gains us one life for each creature we control, and it gives all of our creatures plus one plus one until end of turn. Finally, there's Slate of Ancestry, which is a fantastic repeatable source of card draw. It has pay four and tap it, discard your hand, draw a card for each creature you control. To get the most out of these cards, though, we need to make sure that we can protect those creatures. So it's time for us to move on to tactic number eight. I gotcha, fam. First up, there's Rhythm of the Wild, which says creature spells you control can't be countered. And on top of that, non-token creatures you control have Riot. So when they come into play, they either get a plus and plus one counter or haste. Next up, there's Swiftfoot Boots, which can give one of our creatures Hexproof and haste. This deck does revolve around its commander, so this can be a great thing to equip to it. A good way to protect our entire team, though, comes with Rapid Vigor. For just two mana, it's going to regenerate each creature we control. We've also got some ways to make them indestructible, though, with Boros Charm, Make a Stand, and Unbreakable Formation. Again, with this deck being so low to the ground, we're going to have mana open for these spells. And protecting our team is huge, so we can keep pressing the attack. We even have a creature, though, that can help us out with this with Dauntless Escort. By sacrificing it, creatures we control gain indestructible until end of turn. Outside of protecting our own things, though, how do we make sure that we can deal with our opponent's things, too? Let's find out in tactic number 9, Target Down. First up, there's Oblation, which says the owner of target non-land permanent shuffles it into their library, then draws two cards. If we're desperate to draw some cards, we can even use it on one of our own permanents, too. And we're also running Beast Within and Generous Gift, which can pretty much deal with anything. They each destroy target permanent in exchange for giving that player a 3-3. That 3-3 won't be able to block any of our evasive creatures, so we're just going to be sending it someone else anyways. Like I mentioned before, after all the goading and the dust settles, there is going to be one opponent left. Let's go through how to finish them off in tactic number 10, Big Swing. First up, there's Throne of the God Pharaoh, which says, at the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses life equal to the number of tapped creatures you control. This can be a great way to continuously drain our opponents throughout the game and then to finish off that last opponent. 
Next up, we're running some pump effects with Overrun and Overwhelming Stampede. Overrun's gonna give all of our creatures plus three plus three and trample until end of turn. And then as long as our commander's in play, Overwhelming Stampede's gonna give all of our creatures plus five plus five and trample until end of turn. Now these one-time pump effects can be very effective, but we've also got some anthems too. Collective Blessing says creatures you control get plus three plus three. And Beastmaster Ascension says whenever a creature you control attacks, you may put a quest counter on Beastmaster Ascension. As long as Beastmaster Ascension has seven or more quest counters on it, creatures you control get plus five plus five. So turning every single one of our one ones into four fours or even six sixes is huge. But in my opinion, the most effective anthem in this deck comes with our Golden Pig. The Golden Pig is going to be our number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pig for this deck is Gahichi Honored One. It's a 4-4 beast that costs 2 red, green, white. It says whenever a creature attacks one of your opponents or a planeswalker and opponent controls, that creature gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So this by itself can pump our creatures and incentivize opponents to attack each other on its own. It's going to help our opponents hit each other even harder. And when we're down to that last opponent, it's only going to be helping us. It's a very flexible card in this deck that can help us out in a variety of situations. And that's what makes it the Golden Pig. But now that we've gone through the spells in this deck, let's go on to the mana base. First up, we're running Command Tower, which can tap for any of our colors, and Exotic Orchard, which can usually tap for any of our colors. Next up, we're running three of the Panoramas with Bant, Jund, and Naya. And then there's Sungrass Prairie, which we can pay one into and tap it for green white. Finally, we're going to be running 27 basic lands, 17 of those will be a forest, 7 will be a plains, and 3 will be a mountain. And now that we've gone through every single card in this deck, let's do a quick price check. A quick reminder that our deck costs are calculated using TCG Player Optimization, optimizing with even heavily played and damaged cards because those cards need a home too. The average Marisi EDH rec deck will set you back $228.71. Our deck is going to be much more affordable, coming in at $49.11. Again, the price of this deck is the price that I got for it on the day that I'm recording. If you want to see a breakdown of this deck's cost, check out the link in the description. Keep in mind that prices can and will fluctuate and change over time. But with these deck costs, I want to be as transparent as I possibly can. Again, Commander's Quarters decks are about to be tuned and focused within their budget, but there are always ways that we can improve on them. So let's go through some reasonable upgrades now to see what some of those ways just might be. First up, let's add in Forbidden Orchard and take out a Forest. Next up, let's upgrade this deck with Sarah Ascendant by taking out Sedge Scorpion. And then let's add in Oren Frostfang by taking out Abundance. Next up, we're putting in Grenzo Havoc Razor by taking out Gruul Warchant. And then let's add in Crown of Doom by taking out Overrun. Finally, we're going to be adding in Selfless Spirit by taking out Rapid Vigor. And now it's my turn to hear from you. So in the comments below, let me know what you think about this deck and what you think about the commander in general. And make sure that you're following us on social media for more updates and sneak peeks on future episodes. Links to our social media accounts can be found in the description. Also in the description below is a link to the Commander's Quarters Patreon page, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the patrons who have subscribed so far. There are many benefits to being a patron for the Commander's Quarters, including being able to vote on future commanders for deck tacks. There's even a general level tier where you get your own personalized deck tack dedicated to you. I truly couldn't do this without all of your support, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. If you haven't already, make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we're all about budget commander. So while you're at it, go ahead and check out some of our other types of episodes. And with that, I'm out of here. Thanks again, and have a good one. <laughs>